الحمد لله وكفى وصلاته والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أحل لكم أحل لكم ليلة الصيام الرفث إلى نسائكم وهن لباس لكم وأنتم لباس لهن علم الله أنكم كنتم تختانون أنفسكم فتاب عليكم وعفى عنكم فالآن باشرهن وابتغوا ما كتب الله لكم وكلوا واشربوا حتى يتبين لكم الخيط الأبيض من الخيط الأسود من الفجر ثم تم الصيام إلى الليل إلى آخر الآية صدق الله العظيم We begin with Allah's blessed name we praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters here in Surah and naim in Wang Samaju, in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ramadan is approaching. We do not know which of us would live to see Ramadan. We do not know which of us will experience Ramadan for the last time. And so tonight, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant that we may live to see Ramadan. And to grant that this may be a Ramadan in which we might be forgiven for all our sins. Ameen. Our subject is fasting and power. And one of the constituent parts of power is physical health. The Muslim who is strong and healthy is dearer to Allah the one when compared to the one who is not. If you have a motor car, even if it's a kanchil, you know that you've got to change the oil. If you don't wash the oil in the engine, then you might loss, you might suffer loss of your engine. You know that the car needs to be serviced in order for, for you to maintain the health of the car. In his kindness and in his mercy and in his love for us, Allah has given to us the fast of Ramadan so that the physical body can be serviced. But the servicing of the physical body would not take place if we do not watch the amount of food that we consume in Ramadan. You will not have the benefit of a servicing of the body and a restoration of the physical health. Here in Wang Samaju or in Pakistan when you listen to this lecture or in France when you listen to this lecture 
or the United States or Bosnia or Indonesia, you will not get that benefit. If you fill your plate with food like a mountain and you eat and you eat and you eat until when you finish eating the only thing you can do is and so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us and Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam instituted the Salat of Qiyamul Layl, Salat al Taraweeh, to make sure you can stand up for Salat al Taraweeh. And you cannot stand up for Salat al Taraweeh if you fill the stomach. So if you see your neighbor eating that amount of food, look at him like this. And so the first part of the subject of the relationship of fasting with power is the benefit of fasting for the physical health. We have non-Muslims who envy us for the fast of Ramadan. And some of them non-Muslims would be listening to this lecture. And they would want to join us in the fasting because they understand the benefit for physical health. And so wherever you are in the world and you listen to this lecture, we say to you, just look up in the sky. And when this old moon disappears into the darkness of the sky and the new moon appears, like a little baby, you will begin the fast. And you will fast from dawn until the sun goes down. And then during the night time, Allah says, Wakulu, washrabu, eat and drink. Hatta يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْتُ الْأَبْيَدُ مِنَ الْخَيْتِ الْأَسْوَرِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Eat and drink until the darkness of the night is distinct from the light of the day. But he didn't say to spend the whole night eating and drinking. No. And so we invite you, wherever you are in the world today, we know this is in an age when the barbarians who now rule the world are waging unjust war on Islam. They don't like this kind of language. But we use this language because facts are facts. And we invite you to join with us this Ramadan and fast with us this Ramadan. So you too will enjoy the physical benefit of fasting. But we are inviting you for another reason. And it is that there is but one God. And that God is the God of Abraham alayhi salam. The Jews worship him, but he's not there, God alone. That's nonsense. The Christians worship him. They call him God the Father. But God is not Father. Now, you can only become a father when you have a child. And he says, Lam yalid, walam yulad. He begets not. Nor was he begotten. So to say that God is Father is committing blasphemy. Shit. There is but one God. And that one God has given a command, an order. And if you disobey his order, you pay the price for it. 
يا ايها الذين امنوا او يو هو هاف فيث ان ذات وان جاد كتب عليكم الصيام فاستنج هاز بين ميد obligatory on you you have no choice no option in the matter yes there are exceptions if you are traveling and it's going to be difficult for you to fast then he gives you the facility that you can fast at a later time when your travel is over if you are ill he gives you the facility that you can make up for the fast when you have recovered your health and if you are permanently disabled you cannot fast permanently then he says you can you have a ransom that is you can feed one person for a day in lieu of fasting and so there is no option here it is obligatory it is compulsory and we have to share this information with you so that when you go to the grave you will not say i didn't know the muslims never told me but power depends not only upon external power there is also an internal component to power an internal power is spiritual power internal power is when you are internally healthy and you know that you are internally healthy when the heart is healthy when the heart is turned to allah and you are in obedience of allah's command like fasting and performing your prayers regularly and giving in charity then allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes the veil from around the heart you can graduate with a phd from mit and yet be internally blind you would be living in this world and living for this world and have no consciousness at all in your heart that there is a reality beyond material reality because instead of worshiping allah you worshiping dajjal you know he sees with one eye the left eye and he's blind with the in the right eye it looks like a bulging grip but your lord is not one eyed you know that between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir disbeliever and every mu'min will be able to see it so george bush can't see it <laughs> huh <laughs> every mu'min will be able to see it the mu'min is the one who has faith in the heart not the barbarians who are now dropping bombs indiscriminately on little children and on women on on masajid and they have no shame they're worse than animals no ethics of warfare and these are the people who invite us to follow them they have the road to progress if you think like that you should buy a one way ticket to disneyland stay there and don't come back every mu'min will be able to read the word kafir whether you are literate or illiterate and we have suggested and allah knows best that the left eye symbolizes external sight therefore knowledge externally acquired a phd from 
MIT in Boston. And we have suggested that the blind right eye symbolizes internal blindness. And when you are internally blind, you will eventually come to the conclusion that knowledge comes only from external observation, scientific inquiry. And since this is, now listen carefully, I just mentioned this yesterday at Twin Towers, Petronas. Since, since knowledge comes from only external observation and scientific inquiry, then the only world that we can know is the world that we can observe. Since this is the only world we can observe, this is the only world we can know, that methodology, that epistemology. When you come to the conclusion that this is the only world that we can know, you eventually conclude that this is the only world that exists. And that's where they are, with all their university degrees. That's where they are, for all practical purposes. This is the only world that exists. And anything in religion beyond that is only, they call it window dressing. <laughs> if this is the only world that exists, then there is no reality beyond material reality. Welcome to materialism. Welcome to the modern world. Welcome to humanity today who are living with a spiritual vacuum. They have eyes and yet they cannot see. Most of them are politicians. Eh? I make no excuse for that comment. They have eyes and yet they cannot see. They have ears and yet they cannot hear. They have hearts and yet they do not understand, says Allah in the Quran. In Surah Al-A'raf. They're just like cattle. Rather they're more misguided than cattle. But when we fast, notice what happens. Notice what happens. That at the end of the month of Ramadan, there is something called i'tikaf. And it used to be before Islam, it used to be that you go to lonely places. Huh? And this is why Nabi Muhammad والسلام, used to go up the mountain into the cave. Because that was i'tikaf. He was not the only one. The Arabs used to do that. Very, very good politicians could do that. And when you went to these lonely places, why are you going there? Are you going to take the New Straits Times with you and have it delivered every day? And make sure you have your cell phone with you? And your laptop computer? No, 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 you're doing this to withdraw from the dunya. And there is a philosophy behind it, there's a rationale behind it. That as you withdraw from the dunya, the veils from around the heart and the veils from before the eyes begin to fall away and you begin to see the dunya as an ugly thing at the beginning it was glittering like gold but after you had withdrawn with your etikaf and you had stayed away from the dunya long enough now you have eyes with which to see. And when you look at it, you say, but this thing is ugly. It stinks. 
That's what fasting is for. Because you are staying away from food. You are staying away from drink. You are staying away from the loveliest thing of all that Allah ever created for a man, a woman. Nothing in the world is more beautiful for a man than a woman. And as you stay away from these things, not that they are haram, no, they are halal. As you stay away and you withdraw from the dunya, the spiritual being is activated. And as the spiritual being is activated, Noor enters into the heart. The Noor is always there. It's just that the Noor cannot enter because there are so many veils. And as you fast, the veils are removed. So watch the amount of food in that plate. Watch it. And as you fast, the, the veils are removed. And so the noor can enter into the heart. And when noor enters into the heart, you can see what otherwise you could not see. That's power. That's power. If you are blind, then the Pied Piper can play his tune. And you will follow him like blind mice to Jahannam. But when you have eyes and you can see, you say, no sir. Even if 999 of all, 999 out of every 1000 follow you, I am not going to follow you. I want to share with you something. It's a branch of knowledge called Ilmu, Ilmu Akhirul Zaman. In English it's called Islamic Eschatology. Sorry for the big word. I have studied Islamic Eschatology for many years now. This book Jerusalem in the Quran was published 10 years ago and this book can qualify as a textbook in Islamic eschatology Ilmu Akhiru Zaman and Alhamdulillah we now have it in Bahasa but notice something can you see do you see huh? <laughs> yeah, because you say orang orang so double space it's double size. As a consequence of my study of Ilmu Akhirul Zaman, Islamic eschatology, and I, I am still studying the subject. And you cannot penetrate Islamic eschatology without a knowledge of politics and international politics. You cannot do it without a knowledge of economics and international economics and international monetary economics. You cannot do it without a knowledge of international relations. You cannot do it without a knowledge of philosophy. You have to be a versatile scholar to penetrate Ilmu Akhirul Zaman. And as a consequence of my study of Ilmu Akhirul Zaman, I have come to the conclusion, and Allah knows best, that we are now living at that moment in time when mankind has a choice between two things, that's all. Either you are faithful to Allah, and you do not betray Him. La takhunullah, do not betray Allah. And you faithfully follow Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Or, if you do not, you will be worshipping Dajjal. But, 
most of mankind today are worshipping the Jal and are not conscious of it. Why? One of the major reasons is because of internal blindness. If you do not have noor inside of you, then I can lecture you on riba. And I can teach you the subject of riba. You'll never understand it. No, you'll never understand it. You'll never accept it. Does anyone have a 10 ringgit note? Oh, yeah, good. Mashallah. Here we are. Here we are. What would you say if I say to you that this paper currency is Dajjal's money? Yes? What are you going to do? Are you going to put me in jail for that? Are you going to say this is sedition? Or send me to Guantanamo? Shame on you. Shame of you, shame on you if the scholar of Islam does not have the freedom to speak. I'm not talking to my hat. I have studied internationally, international monetary economics in two universities. I have spent 15 or 20 years of my life in the study of riba. Before I come to say to you, this paper currency is bogus. It is fraudulent. It is haram. It is a vehicle for the exploitation and the legalized theft, stealing of the wealth and the sweat of the masses. If today Indonesia is miserably poor, this is part of the reason for it. If today Singapore is filthy rich, I use the word filthy because sometimes your wealth smells. <laughs> this is part of the reason for it. Well then how is it that so few can understand that Dajjal is the architect of this money? How is it that so few can understand that today's international monetary system has come from Dajjal? <coughs> the answer is because of spiritual blindness. And so when we fast, we fast for Noor. Noor will not come if you have your wife at home and you have another young woman outside in the dark and you go to her in the dark and you come from her in the dark you know like a rat rats don't get noor men get noor and a man takes his woman in the light in the sunshine so that the sunshine can fall on her and so the world can see, this is mine. I am her husband. That's how men behave. Noor will not come to you if you are fasting and yet sinning, committing sin. And so the fast of Ramadan has come to put a break on committing sin and turning to Allah so that Noor can come and that spiritual power that now comes is yet another component of power. But I have one more thing to talk about. One more thing to talk about. In our subject of fasting and power. عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ كُنْتُمْ تَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ After saying to us in Surah Al-Baqarah أُحِلَّ لَكُمْ It is now halal for you 
Laylatul Siyam in the nights of fasting, Rafathu ila nisa ikum to go to your wives is now halal for you, meaning previously it was haram. Well, what is the explanation? The answer is when Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam arose in Mecca as a prophet of Allah the message of truth was being beamed not only to a pagan Arab world but also to those who came before us Banu Israel in particular and they were there in Medina Rabbi Excuse me, Rabbi, why were you in Medina? They used to call it Yathrib. Rabbi is afraid to answer, so let me answer for him. They were there in Medina, the, as the French call it, la creme de la creme. The best of the rabbis were there in Medina. Because they knew that a prophet was coming to Medina. <laughs> And they were broadcasting 24 hours of the day, 7 days of the week from the mountain tops. So all the Arabs would hear, Prophet is coming. When he comes, he's going to be our Prophet. He will empower us and we will overcome you all. And the Arabs were hearing, of course, they had ears, they could hear. And so when the Prophet came to Mecca, a message was being beamed to the Israelite people in Medina as well, not just the pagan Arabs. And when we made the Hijrah and we arrived in Medina, the most important moment in Jewish history had arrived. Wherever you are in the world, the Jewish people, I hope you listen to me. The most important moment in Jewish history had arrived. All the heavens are watching what is going to happen. The Quran says that they could recognize him as a prophet the way they recognize their own sons. The first thing that he did when he arrived in Medina, in Yathrib, was to turn in the direction of Jerusalem to perform his prayer. Rabbi, tell me why would he do that? Rabbi, this man is an Arab. The Arabs venerate that house in Mecca, the Kaaba, al baytul Atiq. Built by Abraham. The Arab, wherever he is in Arabia, he turns towards Mecca. And when he left Mecca and he went outside, he took some of the stones from Mecca with him. So that he could turn towards the stones instead of turning to Mecca. And then he'll take the stones back to the Kaaba and put it there. And that's how the idol worship started because of veneration for that house of worship in Mecca. And every Arab turned towards Mecca, towards the Kaaba. And here he is, and he's an Arab, and he turns to Jerusalem. But that's not all. Are you listening, Rabbi? When he turned to Jerusalem in prayer, his back was turned to the Kaaba. Can any Arab do that and survive? To turn your back to the Kaaba? Why was he turning to Jerusalem, Rabbi? I'll tell you why. Because up to that moment, Allah had ordained that that is the Qibla, the direction for worship. And so when he was in Mecca, he used to perform his Salat from only one corner of the Kaaba. So that he could turn in the direction of both the Kaaba and Jerusalem at the same time. 
And so Rabbi, I hope you are listening. Because there is very little time left before the fireworks start. You know which fireworks I'm talking about. And we're not starting it, Rabbi. Your people are starting it. Here was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This man could not be other than what he said he is, a prophet of the one God. But that was not all, Rabbi. When he arrived in Medina, he also fasted with you. On the days when you fasted, and in accordance with the law of fasting that came down to you in the Torah. No Arab ever fasted like that. That law of fasting was from dawn, sorry, that law of fasting was from sunset to the following sunset. So all through the night and all through the next day, no food, no drink, and you could not go to your wives. Mm -hmm. Why would he do this? There's only one answer, Rabbi. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam and those who followed him are fasting with you on the days when you fast, Rabbi, and in accordance with the law of fasting that came down to you, Rabbi, so that this would constitute evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. This man is worshipping the same God that you worship. This man is following the same religion that you follow. This man is indeed a prophet of God. They decided to test him. And they brought two people to him who had confessed to adultery. And they said, O Muhammad, alayhi salatu wasalam, if you are indeed a prophet of the one God, you judge this case. They set a trap for him. But when you have eyes which you see, you can see a trap. <laughs> when they came to him with these two people, his response was such that it, this is a word which came from Australia, I believe. It boomeranged on them. Huh? Boomerang. <laughs> because he asked, what punishment do you give? Now you could see the sweat on their faces. What punishment do you give? They said, well, we make their faces black and we give them a beating. He then asked, and now they rarely sweating bucket a drop. Is this the punishment in your book? bring the Torah oh my gosh you would love to see this video one day so they had to bring the Torah and because he Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam could not read and could not write not because he was lazy but because Allah kept him that way that this would provide yet more evidence that this Quran could not have come from him. They had to appoint someone to recite from the Torah. The passage dealing with the law of punishment for adultery and fornication, zina. Abdullah ibn Salam, the rabbi, had taken the shahada and become a Muslim when Nabi Muhammad wasalam, arrived in Medina. And this rabbi is now standing next to the Prophet wasalam, as this is taking place. So the man who was appointed to recite from the Torah began to recite and when he came to the verse on Rajam, 
Let me explain to you, George Bush, what is Rajam, if you're listening. Rajam is stoning to death. And it is in the Torah, the book which came down to Moses. Are you listening? Yeah. The book, I'm not talking to him. <laughs> the book which came down to Moses, the Torah, the book is there. And in that book, the punishment <coughs> for adultery and fornication is stoning to death. But when he came to that verse, he put his finger on it and he read over it. So Abdullah bin Salam, the rabbi, he said, Stop. Oh, sorry, Malay, you have to do this. Stop. <laughs> Raise your finger. Raise your finger. Now read. So he had to recite the verse on Rajam that the law of punishment in the Torah for zina, adultery and fornication is stoning to death. So the Jews are now in, it's called monkey pants. They don't know what to do. They've been caught. So they're stammering now, you know, you know, you know, well, you know, when, when the big man committed Zina, we had to let him off. And when the small man committed Zina, we had to stone him to death. And, uh, and we didn't like that. It didn't look good. So we decided to start a new law that we could apply on everyone. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam then gave his judgment, his verdict. That the two people were to be stoned to death in accordance with the law which came down to Moses alayhi salatu wasalam and which was incumbent upon them and therefore on us as well and the two people were stoned to death this was the first time that a Jew had ever seen people being stoned to death for hundreds of years. Here is a man who was enforcing their law. Which they themselves had put in something called cold storage. Here was evidence. As dazzling as the sunshine. This man could not be other than a prophet of the one God, the God of Abraham. But they would not accept him. Now, if he was a Jew, yes. They would have accepted Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. But he was not a Jew, he was an Arab. And they could not accept him, why? If Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam the Arab is indeed a prophet the implication would be that our book the Torah is filled with lies because someone had done a rewriting work on the Torah <laughs> I want to suggest to you that you read a book by Richard Friedman Richard Friedman thank you and the name of the book is who wrote the Bible hmm? maybe some bookshop can order a few thousand copies so KL can read that book who wrote the Bible and the author is Richard Friedman I'm giving him a lot of publicity eh? <laughs> he's an American scholar of the Bible a PhD from Harvard and in that book he confirms what Allah says in the Quran if Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam is indeed a prophet the implication is that our book is filled with lies and they were not prepared to accept that their book had been rewritten and corrupted 
And so in order to stay with their book, they had to reject him. Allah was waiting for that. The heavens were waiting for that. For that moment when they would reject him. This was the one door to mercy that they had. One door to mercy. If they had accepted him and followed him, Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamakum. Allah would have had mercy on them. But they rejected him. More than that, and we do not have the time to share with you the story. They now conspired to destroy Islam. As they are still conspiring to this day. And waging war on Islam. To this day. Hmm? From the Vatican. That war is being waged. From the Vatican with the capital V. That war is still being waged. But only those who have eyes to see would know that the rest are blind it is this it is at this moment that something historic took place in religion the historic moment in the history of religion and there's only one religion the religion of Ibrahim and Islam, only one. Historic moment had arrived. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to do something of profound importance. He closes the door to Tawbah. Shuts it for Banu Israel. The Jews believe that they are the chosen people of Allah. So they are a community, they're not individuals. They believe that they will go for judgment as a community, not as individuals. No. And that as a community they will have salvation and they'll all go into heaven. We believe on the contrary that each one of us will go before Allah individually, singly. And we will be judged singly. A profound difference between the two. So this door is closed. And now only with a Jew accepting the truth and following Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, can he receive forgiveness and mercy what does Allah do he changes the Qibla this change in Qibla is there in the Quran the whole of the Quran came down and Laylatul Qadr inna anzallahu fi Laylatul Qadr but it came down to this Sama'a dunya And from this Sama'a dunya The revelations come down piecemeal Over a period of 23 years This ayah about the change in Qibla is there Waiting to come down And at this moment when they have rejected Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam and are conspiring to wage war on Islam, Allah sends it down. The old, the old law is now cancelled. It's abrogated. The Arabic word is naskh. Naskh. And the law which is cancelled is now Mansukh. Mansukh is not an Arab with a shop in KLCC. <laughs> Mansukh means cancelled, abrogated. Okay? 
So if you turn to Jerusalem after this, in prayer, your prayer would not be accepted. If you turn to Banaras after this, or to Sarnath after this, your prayer will not be accepted, Pandit. And for the governments who now rule over us, if you turn to Washington, yours also will not be accepted. The only way your prayer can be accepted is if you turn to Mecca. This is the new Qibla. He did not say that one year you could turn to the new Qibla, the next year you could turn back to the old one. No. He did not say, well, if you are above 30 years of age, you could still turn to the old one. But if you are younger than 30, you turn to the new one. Did he say that? No. When the old law is cancelled or abrogated, it is cancelled or abrogated in totality. Are you listening to me? Completely. There is no part-time abrogation or cancellation in Islam. Why am I dwelling on this subject so long? Wait, you'll see. And there is another verse up there in the Sama Adunya, waiting to come down. Waiting to come down. It is at this moment, Shaban. It is the second Shaban in Medina. When Allah changes the Qibla, it is that same second Shaban in Medina when Allah also sends down a new law of fasting. Did it come down at this time by accident? Huh? Wake up! There is a reason why he has chosen to change the law of fasting at this time. The old law of fasting is no longer valid. You know, from sunset to sunset. In that old law, we could not go to our wives in the night time. So Allah says, It is now halal for you. Rafathu ila nisa ikum to go to your nisa, your woman, meaning your women who are lawful to you, not those who are unlawful to you. Hunna libasun lakum wa antum libasun lahun. They are your clothing, your garments, and you are their clothing, your garments. When was the last time you forgot to put on your clothes when you went to work? Huh? When was the last time? You, you forgot to put on your clothes when you're going to work? Huh? No, no, no. <laughs> you don't forget to put on your clothes. You and your clothing are inseparable. So too men and women are inseparable. They are your garments, you are their garments. You are inseparable. عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ كُنْتُمْ تَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah knows what you were doing secretly in the night time when you were supposed to be staying away from them. Allah knows what you were doing secretly. فَتَابَ عَلَيْكُمْ Allah has now turned towards you mercifully. وَعَفَى عَنْكُمْ And Allah has forgiven you without our even confessing what we were doing. He says, I know what you were doing. And I've turned towards you mercifully and I've forgiven you. فَالْآن And so now بَاشِرُهُنَّ Now embrace them, your wives. When? In the nights of Ramadan. And when you embrace them, وَبْتَغُوا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَكُمْ 
and now seek for what Allah has written for you meaning how many children you're gonna have how many boys how many girls and when you're going to have Terengganu knows this subject very well Terengganu huh? you know Terengganu yeah I don't know how well KL knows this subject in Terengganu they have big families 13 children 14 children and that gives George Bush a headache <laughs> yes. And so Allah does the writing. Allah does the writing. Allah decides how many children you will have, how many will be boys and how many will be girls. And of course the boys will remain boys provided you don't feed them with meat, with hormone injections. And drink milk with hormone injections. Huh? If you don't do that, the boys will remain boys and the girls will remain girls. But if you do that, guess what's going to happen? <laughs> yes. And so, Allah now says, Wakulu washrabu. Hatta yatabayyana lakum al khaytul abyalu min al khaytul aswari min al fajr. Now, the no law of fasting is that the fast will begin at dawn and end at Sunset and during the nights you can go to your wives. Shahr Ramadan al ladhi unzila fihi al Quran, Hudal lin nasi wa bayinati min al huda wal furqan. Faman shahida min kum al shahra fal yasum. And you will now fast for one consolidated month and it's the month of Ramadan. Hmm? Previous to this, in the old Sharia, you fasted on dispersed days of the year, but now it's one consolidated month. Question Did Allah cancel the old law and replace it with this new law? That one year you would follow the new law of fasting and the next year you could go back to the old law? Come on, shake your heads and tell me. No. Huh? Is the old law completely and totally cancelled? Completely and totally cancelled. There is no such thing as part-time cancellation. Do you agree with me? I hope you do. Because we have something important coming up now. These two things occurred in that same month of Shaban. And we're going to come back to it just now. But then Allah did a third thing. A third cancellation. Mansukh. Nasukh. He says in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ma nansakh. من آية أو ننسها نأتي بخير منها أو مثلها We do not cancel abrogate or cause to be forgotten We do not cancel or abrogate any ayah of ours or cause it to be forgotten but نَأْتِ بِخَيْرٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ مِثْلِهَا We replace it with that which is better or that which is similar. He didn't say that which is different. Did he? He said that which is better or that which is similar. He didn't say that which is different from the first. He said that which is better or that which is similar. Why is Imran Hussein staying so long on this subject? You'll soon know. Allah now cancels the punishment for zina. And I hope George Bush is listening. And I hope the Egyptian armed forces and the Ikhwan al Muslimun in Egypt are listening. Because there's a time bomb waiting to explode. My wife doesn't like me to use this word time bomb. 
let me find something else to use then. There is something, a big, 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 big trap waiting for you in Egypt. If you do not understand this subject properly, the Israeli Mossad is going to reap hay while the sun is shining. He changed the law of punishment for zina. The old law was stoning to death. I hope Karantan is also listening. The old law was stoning to death. That old law is now cancelled, it's now abrogated, it is now mansukh. And Allah replaces it with a new law which is in the Quran. The new law is a public beating. Did Allah change the old law one year and next year you could go back to the old law? Did he make a part-time change in the old law? That if you are 30 years and over, you could stay with the old law. And if you are 30 years and younger, you got to stay with the new law? Now are you understanding me? Huh? Come on, shake your heads a little bit. <laughs> there is only one law of punishment for zina in Islam and that law is a public flogging what do you do when a hadith says something differently from the Quran what do you do when a hadith is in conflict with the Quran or appears to be in conflict with the Quran, what do you do? It is plain and clear as daylight that in this religion it is haram to have sexual relations with a girl until she becomes a woman. Is there anyone who wants to challenge me? It is as plain as daylight from the Quran that it is haram to have sexual relations with a girl until she has become a woman. Meaning, until she reaches the age of puberty and she can now herself become pregnant. Well then, if it is haram to have sexual relations with a girl, when she is six years of age how can you marry her at the age of six? Once you marry her you have the right over her not her father she has to obey you not her father and when you order her to come into your home and you close the door, the father cannot come in. No one can come in. So, are you going to install cameras inside the house? Tell me. You have to accept that the Quran is the primary source of information. It is absolutely authentic and that no hadith shares that status of the Quran. And as a consequence it is the Quran that sits in judgment over the hadith and not vice versa. And when there is even an appearance of a conflict between the Quran and the hadith, we must stay with the Quran. And so when the hadith says, as it does, that Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said that Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam married her when she was six, that's false. Somebody rewrote that hadith. He never married her at six. He never married her in the first place. There was never any marriage ceremony. There are two kinds of marriages. 
They are those marriages that are contracted by Allah Himself there. And there are others that are contracted here. And when He has married you there, who is it? Who is it who is going to contract a marriage ceremony here? Are you a fool? Are you a fool? When Allah has informed him, this is your wife. Can you have a marriage ceremony here? Somebody rewrote that hadith. He never married her in the first place. Allah married them. And Allah could have married them when she was one year of age. Are you listening, George Bush? Allah could have married them when she was one month of age. Because in Allah's law, it would be haram to have sexual relations with her until she has reached the age of puberty. And so tomorrow when the elections take place in Egypt and the Khwan al-Muslimun wins the elections landslide, which is why Washington is now talking to them, and then there's pressure on the Ikhwan as the new Egyptian government to enforce the Sharia. I hope Kalantan is listening. <laughs> and the Sharia is enforced in Egypt. Then an Egyptian family will bring a six-year-old girl before the Sharia court for a nikah with a man who is 55. And excuse my language, please, please excuse my language, because sometimes we have to use harsh language to wake up people. It's not our style, but we have to use harsh language sometimes to wake up people. And these dumb dumbs are going to say jais. And it's going to be captured on CNN and Al Jazeera. And every television station in the world is going to be broadcasting that marriage ceremony which is in conformity with the Sharia, their Sharia. And we Muslims are going to become the laughing stock of all of mankind. And many Muslims are going to leave Islam at that time. Because of an incapacity to understand the law of abrogation. Allah does not abrogate part-time. He abrogates full-time. The new law of punishment is a public flogging. And so when the Mossad pays these two people to go before the Sharia court in Egypt tomorrow and to confess to adultery, the Sharia court in Egypt will have to pronounce stoning to death because both of them are married. Because the hadith says, the rewritten hadith says, like the rewritten hadith says that the prophet married her when she was six, which is false. The rewritten hadith says that if the people who commit zina are unmarried, the new law applies. But if they are married, the old law applies. You know, part-time Nasr, part time abrogation. And so they're going to have stoning to death in Egypt tomorrow. And you can imagine when that is broadcast all around the world. You can just imagine the incapacity of Islamic scholarship to recognize fabricated ahadith. Now, why? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send down the law of fasting at this time? Answer. We are now a new ummah. Prior to this, we and the Jews constituted one ummah. We prayed to the same Qibla. We fasted with the same law of fasting. We enforce the same law of punishment for zina. But now we are a new ummah. And they didn't like that. And Allah warns us. 
they consider this to be a slap on the face to Jerusalem you've insulted Jerusalem by turning away from Jerusalem to turn to that pagan center in Mecca we'll never forgive you for that you've insulted us by turning away and Allah warns us in the Quran you can't arrest me for reciting what is in the Quran can you I don't know any, any government which will dare recite this verse of the Quran but we can do it Latajidanna ashadda nasi adawatan lilladhina amanu al-yahud ila akhil al-ayat you will most certainly find those who have the greatest hatred the greatest hostility the greatest enmity for you would be there among the ranks of the Jews not all Jews you do not take a single verse of the Quran by itself no to get meaning because Allah says amongst the Jews there are those who are believers yes Amongst the Jews, there are those who oppose oppression in Israel. Amongst the Jews, there are those who support the oppressed Palestinian people. Amongst the Jews, there are those who can be our friends and our allies. Oh yes. So do not make the mistake of taking a verse of the Quran in isolation. It is because of this that we are now given the law of fasting. The law of fasting has come down at the same time as the change of Qibla. So that the law of fasting when applied, the fast of Ramadan will empower us as a community. Build bonds between each other that will last forever. That bond that is built in Ramadan consolidates the collective integrity of the Ummah and that translates into power and this is why Allah sent the fast of Ramadan at this time and not before and so fasting is for power physical power internal insight and that also translates to power and the collective experience of fasting bonding together so that you have collective power when we fast together we build memories we build bonds with each other and so try to break the fast as often as you can at home with your wife or if you have more than one wife your wives with your children and the children experiencing the breaking of the fast together from childhood you are planting seeds will last for life for a lifetime you'll be in your grave but they will remember those days when we broke the fast together wake up the children in the morning they would be excited to have the morning meal together even if the child can only fast until 10 o'clock in the morning <laughs> never mind never mind it is the it is the experience the excitement of fasting together that builds memories and build bonds now one last thing before we end when we bonded together in Ramadan all of us fasting together breaking the fast together that bonding together has to be translated to power in a particular way how is it you got to say to them what do you do when you fast you fast for Allah this woman took the Shahada became Muslim she works in an office in Manhattan and this is the first Ramadan she's experiencing and you know every lunchtime 
somebody brings a lunch packet for her and she forgot to tell him I'm fasting now so the first day of fasting came and she took the morning meal but when lunch time came she's hungry and the lunch packet came <laughs> and the door of the office is closed and the window blinds are down nobody is watching nobody is watching and I'm hungry and the food is there she said no no my lord no I'm fasting for you <laughs> and you are seeing me so when I fast I fast for you I give up food for your sake I give up drink for your sake I give up the loveliest thing you've ever created woman for your sake so Allah sends a message to him every day of fasting that message comes to your heart if you can fast for me why can't you live for me he says so kulinna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen say verily my prayer and my service of sacrifice my very living and my very dying all 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 is for you everything I do I do it for you why can't you do that not like the fella in Brooklyn fella in Brooklyn say Lord everything for you but not my green card <laughs> I can't give up my green card God huh? everything for you but you see that US citizenship I need that passport no if anything in this world is dearer to you than Allah you're worshipping that not Allah and so if you can fast for me why can't you live for me how does that translate into power now they're going to say I'm a terrorist oh yes they're going to say I'm a terrorist now because anyone who lives for Allah would be prepared to die for Allah if a man is prepared to die for Allah you can never defeat him you can never defeat him you can kill him you can send him to Guantanamo you can silence him you can declare him persona non grata and throw him out of your country you can do what you want with him but you cannot defeat him because someone who is prepared to die for Allah is prepared to die for the truth and the truth cannot be defeated I want to end with these words that's power that's power no nuclear weapon in the world can destroy that power and so fasting and power because fasting has come to deliver power we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant that this may be the Ramadan where we may be forgiven our sins that Noor may enter into our hearts that we may learn to live for Allah that we may be prepared to die for Allah Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa taba alayna ya mawlana innaka anta tawab rahim Barahmatika ya Ahmur Rahimin. Amin. Uh, would you allow a few questions? I'm ready. If you have any questions, if you want, you can write them down and send them up. Yes. There are many, uh, the, the question is about division within the ranks of the Muslims which mitigate against the development of power, sectarian divisions, the Shia, Sunni, Deobandi, Brelvi, Sufi, Salafi. The first step 
in responding to that is that you and I must stay away from every single sectarian movement. Do not be a member of any sectarian movement. It is only when you stand outside of the sectarian divide, only then you have credentials to address it. After you have declared that I am not this and I am not that and I am not the other, I am a Muslim. Now you have to work to bring the Sufi and the Salafi together. Is it possible? Yes it is. Yes it is. There's a reason why I declined to lead the Salat. <laughs> yes. Because if I led the Salat, then after we have the salams, there'll be silence in the masjid. Any tazkirat, any azkar, will be done silently. If people are late for salat and they're still praying, they would not be disturbed. Hmm? The way to unity is to begin with the masjid. And in the masjid, only the Quran and Sunnah must prevail. No matter what it is, no matter how long you've been doing it, no matter how beneficial it may be, if it is not based on the Quran and the universally accepted Sunnah, do not bring it in the masjid. No. You could practice it at home. Yeah. People, people close the mosque. Pardon me? People are closing the mosque. <laughs> <laughs> when you find yourself in a community where you cannot bring back the sunnah to the masjid, as I have found myself many times, what do you do? This is what I'm doing. I am not picking up boxing gloves. No. I'm doing something more beautiful and more graceful. I'm moving to the remote countryside, something that you Malay call the Kampung. You heard about Kampung? If you never heard about it, wait until Hari Raya come and try to drive on the road. <laughs> Hari Raya for our audience is uh, Edel Fittle. Hmm? I'm moving to the remote countryside and in the remote countryside I'm trying to build a kampung, a Muslim community, a Muslim village. Small. It poses a threat not to nobody. And in that kampung we have only one masjid, only one. And in that masjid we strive and struggle to ensure that only that is permitted in the house of Allah which is based on the Quran and on the universally accepted Sunnah. And so whether you are Sufi or Salafi or Shia or Sunni or this or that or the other, when you come to this masjid and you accept the Quran and the Sunnah, then everybody will worship together in unity. This is my formula for uniting the people. First step, get out of the sectarian divide. Do not be a part of any sectarian movement. Second step, build a masjid. And in that masjid, Quran and Sunnah. And then from that masjid, you now turn to the public life of the village. Not the private life. So if I want to celebrate Milad uh, nabi Maulid, uh, the birth anniversary of the Prophet that's not in the Quran that's not in the Sunnah but large numbers of Muslims do it and they've been doing it for long 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 years I think boxing gloves is going to be more damaging than beneficial uh, so if you want to wage war you go ahead I'm not going to do it I would say you can celebrate your Mila dun Nabi, but do it in private, don't bring it in the public. That's all.
And when you're doing it in the private, and this fellow is not invited because he opposes it, and he now stands up and starts shouting bid'ah and shirk, lift him up and throwing out, throw him out of that village faster than Federal Express. Because he's an agent of fitna. I don't care if he's annoyed with me when he listens to this lecture. It doesn't bother me. This is the format, formula for unity. Any other questions? Yes. You better come a little closer. MashaAllah. In the world of normal states. Sunday night, inshallah. <laughs> Sunday night, yeah. Next one? Yes. And then this one? This one, this one, yes? No, no, one question at a time. <laughs> no satulagi. Uh, I'm glad that you asked that question because it gives me a chance to apply Islamic eschatology to a verse of the Quran. There are some verses of the Quran that could not be understood until events had unfolded in the world sufficiently. And only then you could understand it. This is not because of any deficiency on the part of the early Muslims. It's Allah's wisdom. Here is a verse of the Quran in Surah Al-Ma'idah. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a command. rajim Ya ladina amanu, O you who have faith in Allah. لا تتخذوا اليهود والنصارى أولياء. Do not take the Jews, do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Did you hear? Do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies. Now. There is one methodology for studying the Quran which is wrong. And there's another methodology which is right. The wrong methodology is to take one verse by itself in isolation, stand alone, to derive meaning. meaning. Allah ordered the angels bow down and prostrate before Adam alayhi salam fasajadu illa iblis. And they all bow down and prostrated except iblis. So Iblis has to be an angel. Why? The command was given to the angels. So he has to be an angel. If you use the wrong methodology of studying the verse by itself. But when you go to the rest of the Quran, you begin to feel like a dum-dum. Because when you go to the rest of the Quran, you are told, but angels have no choice. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ Whatever they are commanded to do, they have to do it. No choice. No free will. But this fellow disobeyed, so he could not have been an angel. I mean, only five ringgits worth of intelligence you need. Secondly, when Allah come, question him, why did you not bow down? Tell me your reason. He answered like any graduate of the University of Singapore will answer. He says, Ana khairu minhu. I am superior to him. You created me from fire, you created him from clay, it follows logically therefrom. I am superior to him. They taught me that in the University of Singapore. So why should I bow to him? So this fella has some reasoning power in him. 
he has some capacity for independent thinking he has what can be called a creative intellect are angels capable of that the angel said to Allah la ilma lana illa ma allamtana we have no knowledge other than that which you give to us so an angel can be very very learned but all of that knowledge has come to him because Allah gave it to him he cannot pursue knowledge independently huh? and this fellow is doing it so he could not have been an angel and then in Surah uh, uh, Kahf Allah says well, kana min al -jin. Kana min al -jin. so we are given the correct methodology of study of the Quran that you must get the totality of the verses pertaining to a subject and bring them all together into a harmonious whole because there is no contradictions in the Quran and then you get the system of meaning of the subject similarly now for this one do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your friends and allies wrong methodology and you say well all Christians and all Jews we're not allowed to have any friendship with any Christian and any Jew that's the wrong methodology but when you take the totality of the subject all the verses then Islamic eschatology helps you Allah is speaking and saying do not take such Jews and do not take such Christians as your friends and allies who themselves are friends and allies of each other Jews and Christians were never friends and allies of each other the Christians accused the Jews of the ultimate crime of killing God himself can't do worse than that so this verse of the Quran is anticipating a time which is to come when there will be a mysterious reconciliation between some Christians and some Jews and a mysterious Christian Jewish alliance is going to emerge when that happens you are prohibited from being friends and allies of such Christians and such Jews that Judeo-Christian alliance and if you declare your friendship as every government does in the Muslim world today if you declare your friendship for them you no longer belong to us you now belong to them that's why I tell you politicians should come and study the Quran politicians should come and study the Quran and I want to extend an invitation to them any one of them who would like to come and study with me I'd be happy to teach them I have some seniority on my side they most, most of them younger than me Inna Allah la yahdil zalimin Allah will not provide guidance for a people whose trademark is their zulum Judeo-Christian alliance has a trademark of zulum, oppression hmm? has it emerged now? it has it wasn't there a thousand years ago but the Judeo-Christian alliance is today the Zionist Judeo-Christian alliance who controls Washington today? the Washington with which you are so friendly it is the Zionist Judeo-Christian Alliance so when you say you are friends of Washington you are friends of the Zionist Alliance and once you declare your friendship with that Alliance Allah says you no longer belong to us you belong to them 
You're no longer worshipping Allah, you're now worshipping Dajjal. But there are other Christians and there are other Jews. In the Quran, Allah speaks and says, Wala tajidanna aqrabahum mawaddatan lilladhina amanu lilladhina qalu inna nasara. And a time will come when you'll find those, who's, those who are closest in love and affection for you would be those who say we are Christians. Huh? So we do not cut blanche, lump them all together in one basket and pass judgment. We've got to distinguish those Christians and those Jews who are supporters of the state of Israel, the Zionist alliance from the rest of the world of Christians and Jews who are not supporters of that alliance. These Christians and these Jews are people who are potentially friends and allies if we work on them. Have I answered you? Not as yet. <laughs> One question here and then you and then that's it. But you should be able to answer it yourself. <laughs> Anytime the Prophet ﷺ enforced the law that was in the Torah, the implication would be that the abrogation of that law had not yet taken place. That's so simple. <laughs> All right? And he did enforce the law of stoning to death. Yes? But once the abrogation took place, now a new law has come. And uh, on this issue, we must not pick up boxing gloves. No. Those who want to stay with the ahadith and believe that this is the law, if you are married, stoning to death, if you are not, flogging, let them stay with their views. No need for any boxing gloves. When, however, the explosion takes place next year and it's broadcast all over the world and we become the laughing stock of mankind. At that time, of course, if you have tears to weep, you'll have to weep. Okay? So we must not take our boxing gloves. Don't argue with people. No. Just state your position and if they reject it, leave them. Leave them. Go your way peacefully. We go our way peacefully. However, if you come after us with boxing gloves, and if you make the mistake of trying to silence us, and you will not allow us to speak, then you must know we will challenge you. When we have no more patience, we will challenge you. And shame on you on that day if you back down from the challenge. We will challenge you and we'll say, come. Come. You say, that is the law. We say, this is the law. Come and let us raise our hands and pray to Allah. And ask him to curse. With an eternal curse. And to punish with eternal punishment whosoever is wrong. Come if you have courage and integrity. We hope that day will never come. We must prefer, let us defer, you go your way, we go ours. One more question. Okay, my told me, uh, we are, we are called <laughs> So they said that we are Bani Israel. Uh. You come from a land which has never been conquered by modern Western civilization. Britain, Britain tried and Britain failed. 
You come from a land, Afghanistan, which has never been conquered by modern Western civilization. Britain tried and Britain failed. And then Russia tried and Russia failed. And guess who is trying now? <laughs> Uncle Sam. He's going to fail. But on that day when the United States starts to withdraw from Afghanistan, and NATO starts to withdraw from Afghanistan, that's the beginning of the end of Israel. We don't need the Ahadith really <laughs> to know that's the beginning of the end of Israel. Because you did 9-11, the Israeli Mossad is the architect, the designer of 9-11. 9-11 could not have been could not have taken place without Mossad planning and implementation. Mm -hmm. And then you put the blame on us. Mm -hmm. Shame on you. That's not Judaism. And there are many Jews in the world who probably be saying shame on you as well. Because they know who did it. They know who did it. And then you use 9-11 to invade Afghanistan. Why Afghanistan? Because your target is Pakistan. That's why. And you've had your eyes on your target for 10 years now. Your target is Pakistan. That's why you want to be in Afghanistan. Barack Hussein Obama may not understand it, so I have to explain it to him. Israel cannot rule the world. This is the book you have to study. Jerusalem in the Quran to understand the politics of the world today. Israel wants to rule the world. So when they said that we only want to create a homeland from the Jews, they told a lie. When they went to the UN and said we're just creating a Jewish homeland, they told a lie. Israel was not created just to be a homeland for the Jews. Israel was created to rule the world. Israel has to succeed the United States and replace the United States as the next ruling state in the world. And when Israel rules the world and a man has to rule the world from Jerusalem. 1400 years ago, Nabi Muhammad explained and described that man to us. But governments are not interested in this subject. They're interested in highways and byways, but not in this subject. That's why I invite the politicians to come, let me teach you. That man was described 1400 years ago. And that man will stand up in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah, Al-Masih. And Nabi Muhammad said, no, he would not be the Masih. He would be Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Dajjal, the false Messiah. But Israel cannot rule the world without waging big wars. And Israel cannot wage these big, particularly on the Arabs. The Arabs have to submit to Israel. And the first state probably to be attacked would be Egypt. This book will explain to you why. Israel cannot wage these big wars so long as Muslims have a weapon with which they can retaliate effectively. Nuclear weapons. So the world of Islam has to de be deprived of any weapon with which it can defend itself. So they had 9-11 so they could go to Afghanistan and from Afghanistan wait for the moment when they could attack Pakistan and destroy the Pakistani nuclear plants and nuclear weapons. And guess what the Pakistan armed forces did? These people who are so deficient in faith and deficient in understanding and even in common sense. I'm not talking about the soldiers who love Islam and who give their lives for Islam. I probably have lots of fans amongst them. I'm talking about the crooks who control strategic decision making. 
in the Pakistan Armed Forces and the Pakistan government. They're crooks. And most Pakistanis will agree with me. They are the ones who have supported the Zionist war on terror for the last 10 years. They are the ones who have been supplying routes for the fuel to go to Afghanistan to their American forces. Pakistan armed forces help them to go to kill your own Afghan people. Hmm? This is what they've been doing. And so, I said, no one has conquered Pakistan, Afghanistan so far. And on that day when they start to withdraw from Afghanistan, that's the end of Israel. But between now and then, there are a lot of fireworks to take place. And we're expecting it to start this year or next year. But Nabi Muhammad wasalam, there is a hadith about the black flags from Khorasan, which has been accepted by most Muslims for 1400 years. And when that army comes, no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. So a Muslim army will liberate the Holy Land. But it's not going to be a frontal attack on the Israelites. No. The Gog and Magog war would have taken place and that would destroy the power of modern Western civilization. There's a book of mine outside entitled An Islamic View of Gog and Magog in the Modern World. Unfortunately, most of the literature that we now have on Gog and Magog came from Disneyland. <laughs> I'm sorry to say so. It's sad for me. At that time when the Muslim army comes out of Afghanistan and Khorasan, the Jews are going to be running. It's not a stand-up fight. Because the Prophet said, Let the Qatilunna al Yahud, you'll most certainly fight the Jews. I quoted this hadith at the State University of New York in Stony Brook ten years ago, with the Jews sitting in front of me. It's before 9-11. They went and they complained to the rector of the university that I was inciting people to kill Jews. Our response is, if we do not have the freedom to quote the prophet, tell us in your American democracy. They never bothered with me. Latukatilunna al-Yahud, you'll most certainly fight the Jews. Because Harun here doesn't know this. And you'll most certainly defeat them. And Harun Yahya doesn't know this. At that time even the stones will speak. Harun Yahya doesn't know that. Ya Muslim, Aza Yahudiyun wara'ifa ta'ala faktul. O Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me, so come and kill him. Harun Yahya will never say that. That's going to be the day when the Muslim army comes out of Khorasan and the Holy Land is liberated. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna kanta samiul alim wa tuba alayna ya mulana inna kanta tawabra.